Welcome to the Client Barker Podcast, episode 101. Another wonderful show. <laughs> this one is um, is Clive Barker news and community feedback and questions and stuff like that. So um, you'd think that it would be short, but we stretched it out quite a bit. Episode 101 of the Clive Barker podcast. Another wonderful show. Welcome. How's it going? Hey, it's going well. It's, going well it's here. Episode one hundred and one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we passed the one hundred mark, and and uh, we were just talking about this a little bit earlier that we've hit um, year to date now. We've hit over twenty one thousand downloads, and then another five hundred people like play it on streaming or whatever. Man, oh, that's, that's we really insane. appreciate that. Yeah, or our yeah, listeners. Thanks to all our listeners. Yeah, you, you sent me like the. The downloads for last week were like over 720 downloads. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. Yeah, I'm, I'm really uh, thankful to all our listeners. And, uh, you know, hey, we're, we just do this for uh, your amusement, guys. So thank you for, uh, thank you for listening and give yeah. us some feedback. We always appreciate that. Yeah, so um, what we've kind of, and we talked about this a little bit last week, and what we're doing now is uh, every other episode we're going to catch up on the news. Uh, Rob's been really good about keeping us up on the, on the news with the blog, um, but, you know, in the episodes, we, I think we were getting bogged down too much by spending an hour on the news and then another hour on our main topics. So I think this is e- it's easier this way. Yeah. Sure. It gives us more time to focus on actual uh, topic episodes as well. So if we have to, like, review a book like, say, uh, Everville, yeah. which is a pretty big book, that gives us more time between episodes to be able to uh, to read the book and properly prepare for uh, for our yeah. topic episode. Yeah. Um, so in Clive Barker news, I guess the first one is that the Waxworks Records LP of Nightbreed has been on sale for a little while now. Uh, it's $28. Um, that's the one, it's got a completely different cover from the old, uh, the old, uh, soundtrack album release. It's, it's not difficult to have a, a different cover. The, the, the one I have is pretty much all black and, uh, you yeah. only have like the, 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 the letters saying Clyde Barker's Nightbreed. Yeah. And, yeah, exactly. And so, know, just like the, the CD. Embossed. Yeah. The cover yeah. is a little embossed, but uh, in the LP, but then the CD is almost completely black just with a purplish letters say Nightbreed. So, but still amazing CD. Lovely soundtrack. I really recommend it. Yeah. Yeah, was it when we were at the at when we were at the um the screening for Nightbreed, the girl sitting next to me was saying that her CD didn't have country skin on the end of it. Mine does. I don't mine, know what yeah. she was listening to. Yeah, her. mine does too. I was just thinking, oh, yeah, where did she get? maybe that's the cassette? Yeah, the music is called Skin, and it's yeah. the country version, because apparently there's another version of Skin, which is not country, right? I don't I know. Played by Oingo Boingo or something like that? Hmm. I don't know. I only know the Nightbreed one. But, um, I'm not very familiar with Oingo Boingo. So. But I wonder if that's one of those things where they got cut off of the cassette or something. Could be, yeah. Uh, mine doesn't have a song on it either like that. It doesn't have country skin? No. It's, it's just that, a score. It's, it's that, uh, yeah, that song that plays on the end credits. No, mine does not have that. They must have cut. Really? They must have had to remove it, maybe because of Ongo Boingo, maybe having to get. I mean, it was uh, because of royalties or something, or. Huh. Looks like but we I, mine mystery. does not have that. All right, so uh, wow. mine, mine has. I bought mine when I was back in Europe, so I don't know exactly what what edition my CD is. I would imagine it was the uh, normal, you know. First edition of the CD. Uh, yeah, I so, bought mine sometime in the mid-90s. Yeah, me too. So, 
Interesting. Now that's a mystery. I'll I'll have to go check. Uh, there's a website for that. A website for soundtracks, and uh, I might go check yeah. that and see if there's more versions of the Nightbreed soundtrack. Hey, that... I'll have to look at it, Mon, too. Because, hey, uh... this would be an interesting, uh, an interesting kind of collector's corner sort of a note. We could talk about the different editions of Nightbreed, and maybe it would be. In, I'd be interested to see like a, a screenshot of the backside of your CD. With yeah, the sure. track list and stuff, and 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 see if if we can pick out other differences between yours and the one that Jose and I have. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah. And, sure. and we could yeah. talk about the record, and then the new record and stuff. Were y'all planning on buying a this a uh, this a uh, new waxwork record? Uh, uh probably not. I I mean, really, for me, I only buy vinyl if I can't get something on any other format. So, like, I'll buy bootleg records of. You know that you can't get on CD, but it's really beautiful. Though I mean, I looked at it, and the, the vinyl is—it's uh, a mix of different color vinyls. So you have this like starburst effect, with, mm-hmm. like white and pink. So it's really pretty. I, I saw how they, uh, they did it, but uh, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I have the original soundtrack, and this is like a reissue. Yeah. Usually, I don't go much for reissues. It's also also remastered. Uh, maybe it even sounds better. But it's, uh, it's got cool artwork on the cover of it. It does, yeah. yeah. I don't know yeah. if that, but it's uh, cool. Rich Kelly. Oh, okay. There you go. Hmm. So I thought um, maybe yeah. I just I thought maybe about getting it just in like I've been uh, rede- redecorating my wall. I thought maybe just putting it yeah. up on my wall. Oh yeah. Because I don't <laughs> I don't have a record player. I used to have a ton of those album frames, uh, and I hung up. I put records in them, and I put laser discs in them. Oh yeah, cool. But it kind of those that. frames were sort of bending the corners of the of the album covers. I don't have a record player either. Well, the good thing is now nowadays all the the vinyl albums that you buy in stores they come with like a digital download code yeah. that you can use to download uh, the music onto your computer. So even if you don't have a, a record player and say you want to buy an album because it looks nice on your wall, you can do it and still listen to the music. Hmm. Um, next one, the uh, new Brazilian limited edition of the Hellbound Heart uh, is being sold by Darkside Books, I guess, is the publisher. So an interesting thing, it looks like um, is it it's a leather bound. Yeah, and it's got a it's got a picture of Simon Sacy's design for the the, the um, puzzle box on the front. Such there's a some, beautiful cover. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I think there's more cool stuff inside of it. I just couldn't read the site because it's in Brazilian. Oh, wait a minute. I'm Portuguese, so I can read that. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, go hey, for it's it. It's Portuguese. Thanks. Let me see. I'd like to know what's it's, in there. It's Dark Side Books, and the the website is Brazilian. And then it says, Hellraiser, Renascido do Inferno, which means in English translation, Reborn from Hell. So apparently uh-huh. that might be the uh-huh. subtitle in Brazil. It says, a book so spooky that no national publishing house had the courage to... Uh, publish it, but I <laughs> think you are safe. Dark Side Books uh, is bringing to Brazil the long-awaited Hellraiser Reborn from Hell, the novel that made Clive Barker a living legend of terror. The book uh, arrives at bookstores in September 2015, and the uh, the day uh, uh, well, let's say the day before the 30th anniversary of its international uh, publishing. So, um, yeah, it's oh. a beautiful-looking book. Uh, the Cenobites are coming. That's what it says here after the picture. And then it just has a small uh, synopsis about uh, uh, the Hellbound Heart that was written in 86. Mm. And then, of course, the, the, the movie adaptation. And, um, yeah, it, it looks nice. I'm, I'm looking at the pictures of it. It looks and, big. I mean, do you, does it, does yeah, it, it does. do you think it has extra stuff in it besides the novella? That's what I was thinking. Like the script for I, Hellraiser, maybe? Hmm. I don't see it. They don't list anything here, like yeah. what's inside. Well, and they wouldn't translate a screenplay into into Portuguese anyway, right? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. They could. I mean, some, some so? countries translate everything, so I wouldn't yeah. be surprised they did. But uh, it, just, uh, it just says here it's from Dark Side Books. There's going to be a limited edition, hardcover, and a classic edition. Hmm. Um, and, uh, bu- 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 that's, that's pretty much it. I don't see any more, more information. Oh, here, technical specs. It says, uh, translated by Alexandre Kalari. 
uh, published by Darkside uh, in Portuguese, 160 pages. That is and, bigger than normal. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know if it's going to have any more extra content inside. They maybe, don't say anything. About maybe it. there's just a lot of bigger words in Portuguese. Does it, <laughs> does, it have a, does it have a price listed? Price, price, price. Um, on the post that's in our news uh, post, I don't no, see just, a price listing yeah, yet. Yeah, I did. So uh, it's going to come out in them. September. Okay. Well, that's cool. I mean, the 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 design is actually the hell, you know, the movie design of the puzzle box instead of the it would just be a black it would be a black shiny square if it was <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's right. from Hellbound Heart. The Hellbound yeah. Heart it's just a, a six black lacquered faces yeah. that have that seem polished and don't have any ornamentation on them. Which, thank goodness for that, you know, Simon Stacey and Clyde Barker came up with a, a much more ornate and more interesting looking box. Well, the, and it's become an icon of the of the Hellraiser series. Funny thing, our friend David, David Anderson, who was our, you know, co-host on the last episode, by yeah. proxy, he yeah. actually made it for his collection once. He, he took the time to make, construct a box uh, that does the star configuration. He made it out of wood oh, and he painted it all black and, you know, polished it. So wow. nice. it, I remember seeing the old uh, NECA uh, website. They used to have co- collector profiles on their Hellraiser uh, mini website. And so one of the fan profiles they did was on David, on our friend David. And oh, he, wow. he, post, he sent them oh, a few wow. pictures of his collection. Hey, David, so one, we know you're listening to this, so can you take a picture of that and put it on the Clyde Barker Collector's Facebook page? Oh, yeah. yeah Clyde Barker Collecting, yeah, the, the yeah. Facebook group. Uh, yeah, that, that, I thought it was really cool because he actually took the time to cut the wood in the two parts that would make the shape configuration of the box, and he just painted it all black, just like how Bon Hart says. Wow. That's cool. That I is like cool. I'd like to see that, yeah. Uh, Can you share that with us, David? Yeah, and and speaking of uh, Clive Barker book re-release news, the Great and Secret Show is now available on audiobook, uh, so you can get it on on Audible and on iTunes and probably other places as well. Those were the two that I you know knew. Those were the two places that I knew to look. Sure. Yeah. Audible. Yeah. Well, Audible. You've got a nice a little... audiobook uh, if you and, uh... register to a trial. Yeah, it was like twenty-two hours or something. It is twenty-two yeah. hours, and twenty-four minutes, 20, yeah. <laughs> yeah. unabridged. And if you're wondering who narrates it, it's a guy called Chet Williamson. Yeah, that's that that a, that's intense. That's a lot of, uh, but it's a big book. It's like seven hundred pages, I think. Oh, yeah. It's under like, seven hundred, just about seven hundred. Yeah, like six six eighty or something like that. Yeah. I guess it depends on what edition you're. Reading, yeah, like paperback yeah. or the hardcover. I have the UK hardcover. And I think that the cover of this audiobook that I'm looking at on Audible, and we will add that to, to the show notes. But uh, the cover is made by Christian Francis. I think he's been doing a lot of uh, um, uh, audio book covers for Sarah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so they've got kind of the letter boxes along the sides of the original cover. Yeah. Yeah. Also, do you remember when we were in LA and uh, the Seraphin office? We saw the original painting for this cover for the yeah the show. yeah hanging up in that spare bedroom. Yeah, the one that has the the engineer and Groucho Marx. And, yeah. Uh, a bunch of like weird oh. Oh. engineer phantasmagoric yeah. images. Yeah, that was really cool. Uh-huh. I never noticed that. That's- yeah, he's in the background. There was a little yeah, color see him, box. Yeah, see him right now. He's next to the guy wearing the hat. Yep. So cool. there's a lot of uh, interesting stuff in the background there. We saw the original one. It was in a room, uh, in a more secluded room, that had the, uh, the, the, the secret secret passage through the closet. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. If I, yeah. If well, well, yeah, where you could watch through the, the two-way mirror. You could look at people in that room. <laughs> Oh, so nice. it's it's a really cool it's a really cool thing that I don't know if I should say this on air but you know, it's cool. Fly Barker's house is secret passages. So. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know. Did we we probably talked about the Clive Barker Society already? 
Yeah. Yeah, but we can always talk about it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, geez, just um, so we're um, it, it's um, what was I what was I saying? Sort of lost my train of thought. Uh, there's the collector, isn't there? There the collector's version and the um, standard and version. the standard version, and uh, yeah, it's kind of a you know re- renewing the the idea of the fan club. Seems like fan clubs have sort of gone away a little bit because of Facebook and and uh, you know people get to con- you know there's no more newsletters and things like that so much anymore. Yeah, yeah, I remember um, the only. Club Barker fan club I was a member of was Lost Souls, mm. the old uh, the old uh, fan yeah. club that was run by uh, Cheryl Benson and uh, Stephen Dressler. And um, I would get the Lost Souls newsletter like every couple of months or something. And they, yeah. usually they would include in the in the envelope they would always include like a goodie, like like a, a, a Magic a game card or. Mm. Like a print or like an invitation to like a Clyde Barker uh, exhibit or something like that. Oh, cool! So that was cool. I remember that. I used to read the the Lost Souls newsletter, and at the end there were like a section for pen pals. So, yeah, I oh, still yeah. In the nineties. I remember the letter that I sent them. I was like, uh, I said something like, "I would like to to subscribe to Lost Souls, so I'm enclosing an international money order for like I don't forgot how much it was at the time." You know, so you're you're getting my soul for that amount of money, and that's cheap. <laughs> <laughs> I remember including that in the letter. So. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> so the Clive Barker Society uh, website is already live. It's www.clivebarkersociety.com, and you know, like like you said, there's a standard and a collector's uh, account that you can get. So the the one year membership is forty nine dollars for standard, and one hundred twenty nine dollars for collector. But so the thing is that they will send you different stuff. Um, so the forty nine dollars <laughs> gets you the welcome letter, the society t shirt, and the society pin. And also standard level members will also receive the quarterly Clyde Barker newsletter. And the collector one, um, and I'm going to say this again. I'm, I'm sure we said this before, but in addition to receiving the standard level rewards. Collector level members of the Clyde Barker Society will receive a minimum of four collector's packages over a 12 month period. These mailings are designed to be a throwback to the days of vintage fan clubs. Each item you receive in your packages will be a small run item available only through the Clyde Barker Society and will not be made available anywhere else. The team works closely with artists and small manufacturers to ensure that you have the most rewarding member experience possible. These boutique items are Fully autographed. Uh, I'm sorry. Fully auto- authorized and fully licensed by Clyde Barker, and make sure, and will and and are sure to make you the coolest creature on your block. <laughs> so yeah, it's like a little uh, loot mailing that you get, like a little loot crate. Yeah, yeah, which is awesome. I mean, and his that that whole. I mean, we haven't we haven't seen the, the house that he lives in, but the studio house. There was so much stuff everywhere, and and. Uh, I can just imagine all the cool stuff they can come up with to put, you know, to, to send to send out to those people. Yeah. And then, like, like when the Scarlet Gospels came out, they were making those uh, little, uh, um, what do you call them, the book things that you put to, to keep your spot in the book. Yeah, bookmarks. Bookmarks, yeah. Yeah, so like, those like... English is a second language to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was, um, what are they, Pentacrater? Yeah, yeah, they were doing those things too. Yeah, bronze and silver. Yeah. So who knows? They might, might be including some of those bookmarks or little postcards on the mailings. Uh, yeah, stuff like that. that would be neat. A fan mm-hmm. was asking when this starts up. I, I don't. I didn't know how to answer their question on that. Oh, I, like when do they start sending you things? Yeah, I don't know what the. I, I don't know the answer to that either. It'd be easy to find out. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't say on their website though. Um, yeah. But um, there's, Thomas, there's a contact. Yeah, yeah there's a contact page. Uh, have a question? Write to us. So you, yeah. if you go to clybarkersociety.com/slash/contact, you can ask them that. So you might get mm-hmm. your answer. Yeah, and uh, oh, Del Howison, um did an interview about Midian Unmade, 
Um, so Rob, you made oh, a right. you made a post about that. Put some of the highlights in there, or they can just click the link and go through to the whole thing. And he, he talks about how he ch- you know the, the the process of having to sort through all the stories and how they decided on which ones to include in the in the anthology and which ones not. Uh, and they could, you know, it turns out that they had a lot of authors that were already chosen, so they could only really pick just a few uh, stories from the, you know, from the public. Yeah, that's right. I remember he he said that first before this interview. He said that uh, he explained how the selection process went in the Occupy Midian. And, yeah, mm-hmm. I remember reading about it. And he, he actually included how many numbers of uh, – what were the number of slots that they have for... Uh, was it like six or say it was really small? Yeah, it was something like that. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there was a signing for Midian Unmade on August 1st and 2nd. Um, and uh, he's, and then uh, and then you could buy those autographed copies for twenty four ninety nine. So I've got one uh, just arrived a couple of days ago. Yeah, so I posted that on the... On the Midian side, or yeah, Occupy yeah, on no, Occupy it? Midian, I took a little picture of it. Yeah, so I got a cop. I did. I finally, I got a cop. Somebody was selling a copy of it on Amazon for five bucks. So I picked oh, it wow. up. Oh wow! So they probably just well, read it and yeah, it was read it and sold it. Yeah. Pretty just much. for curiosity's sake, uh, and I'm sorry if I'm going back to the thing we just finished talking, but for curiosity's sake, um, on Midian on May, uh, on on Midian. Uh, Sorry, let me just rewind that. Occupy Del Hollis posted on hmm. Occupy Midian how they did the selection. So oh, I yeah. think this may be a little as detailed as what he said in the interview. He said, I read half the stories, which included my invitees, and Joe read the other half and his invitees. Yeah, We would still be reading stories if both of us <clears throat> were going to read all, all the stories. Since our deal was that we both had to like the stories for whatever reason for them to go into the book. If I read a story and didn't want it in the book, or Joe did the same, it was never passed on to the other editor. There would have been no point. There yeah. were plenty that the first person, either Joe or myself, read, liked, and passed on, and the second person didn't. So those were rejected. That left a second pile of stories, those that were read and liked by both editors. That pile probably had 40 stories in it for six spots in the book. Then those yeah. 40 were read and discussed and gradually whittled down to the final tally. On our first read, if someone wrote a story over 5,000 words, which was in the guidelines, I didn't read it. I usually did email the author and give them a chance to knock off enough words to get within guidelines and resubmit it to me. On the other hand, Joe read all of his tales, whether or not they met the guidelines. That was his choice and fine with me. I've edited enough books that if people decide to ignore the guidelines, that I assume they must have thought I wrote for my help, not because of space requirements we had to meet with the publisher. <laughs> yeah. So, so some of the guidelines, the guidelines were like no, uh, no, no stories from the past, right? Like, or no, 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 like prequel stories. It had to be like after the fall of Midian. I think. Yeah, yeah, so and it was uh, funny because when this first came up, you and I were both wanting to do like an origin of Baphomet, and it's like, well, that would get yeah. rejected. And and yeah, Roger made a poem uh, and, that that got rejected just because it didn't fit the. Um, sure. Yeah. The, the model of the short story. Yeah. yeah. He said, and also I wasn't interested in humoring the person who sent me something that broke the guidelines. It was the luck of the draw as to whether Joe or myself received the story to read. So yeah. that's how they did it. So when you think about it, this book has like, uh, let me look at it. Uh, I have six slots for um, fans, fan yeah. submissions. But the book has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. So there were 23 stories and only six open slots for fans, which gives us uh, 17 for invited writers. Yeah. Which is surprising to me because I thought, you know, I, I read the book and I thought some of the stories were from fans. But no, apparently they must have – most of them were from uh, invited authors. Yeah. I, it and would be kind go. of – you know, and, and you kind of – we talked about this when, you know, from all the people who got rejected, like you and me, you know, and, and uh, there were a lot of other people on Occupy Midian that that had stories that were rejected. And we talked about kind of making our own sort of, uh, you know, underdogs version, you know, because the, oh, yeah. the Nightbreed are sort of outcasts and underdogs. And that's kind of what we would be, the people whose stories didn't make it. That's kind of a cool idea. 
Yeah. You know, and I'd love to take some time and kind of rework mine, you know, using the feedback that I got. Because it's like the feedback you get isn't, doesn't help you because, you, you know, it's a rejection, basically. But, but um, you should post your story in the website, the podcast uh, yeah. blog. I, after what he said I about it, I was a little bit embarrassed to, to post it. Oh, you got you got the comment on it? I just got like a rejection slip. Oh, um, yeah. He said mine was cartoony and overwritten. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Who said that? Uh, Del Howison. So okay. so Jose and I had di- different editors for, you know, that, that reviewed ours. So yeah. you had Joe Nassis and I had Del Howison. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's right. Mine was well, just a simple, um, a simple. Um, I read yours. I've never read Ron's. Yours was very good, Jose. Yeah, it was very yeah. good. Yeah, mine just said, "Dear Jose, we're going to have to pass on your story for meeting unmade. It isn't quite what we're looking for at this point. Thank you for the submission." So that that was my rejection slip. My one first rejection slip. <laughs> hmm. Maybe yeah. Maybe now that the book's out, maybe I'll post mine up as a story yeah. you know, on the blog. Just yeah, for I, I like your story. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, sure. So Ron yeah. hasn't read it yet, so yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll I'll read it. It. yeah there was I'll something it called uh, "Someone's Left Arm" or something. Oh, uh, what was it? Ah, uh, I, I I remember the the title and what happened in it. I uh, Jerry's arm or something like that. Jerry's I, left arm or Jerry's yeah. right arm, something like that. Yeah, yeah. I'll have to yeah, I'll have to dig that up and post it in uh, there. I thought it was interesting. Um, Paul Kane gives an update on Monst- the Monsters book. So this was like, this this might be old news that you can't, may not be able to act on anymore, but if you email alchemypress at gmail.com, you could get, there. they had a few copies left of the Paul Kane's Monsters book, the hardbacks. Is that a compilation of stories? Yeah, I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And Clive okay. just provided the artwork. Yeah, he did the cover art, yeah. which is that same... Isn't that that same picture that was on the Rue Morgue cover? Yeah. With, with the, the guy with the bat ears, bat wing yeah. ears. And, yeah. Yep. Um, uh, and uh, Rob, you had done some retro v- reviews, so people should go check those out on Hellraiser 2, 3, and 4... And the uh, and you did one on the the um, work print work print bloodline. cut work of, print for bloodline yeah for bloodline I actually I guess it's not officially movies. called four but I still I always call them by their numbers and it was mm-hmm. they didn't know whether they were going to call it Hellraiser four or not they changed that at the last second oh really it was still going to be we call it was still going to be called Hellraiser four until like maybe a couple weeks until they released it yeah there was a big um, there was a big. What am I thinking of? It was a big trend to stop numbering movies after number three in the 90s. Yeah. It's kind of like they're embarrassed or, you know, it'll make it sell less or it might be a stigma that would put it direct to DVD if something was a number four or a five. Yeah. I remember uh, Doug Bradley mentioning uh, something about the sequels. I, I remember hearing him talk about this in an interview somewhere. I can't, I can't pinpoint where I heard this, but he mentioned something like after Hellraiser three that it was uh, the beginning of the that, that's when the colons came on the titles and it was <laughs> yeah. just like Hellraiser colon Bloodline yeah and Hellraiser Inferno and the numbers just you know weren't you know being used yeah. anymore but uh, sure I mean Hellraiser two we call it two but it's not I don't think the two is in the title it's just Hellbound oh wait no it is Hellbound yeah it's Hellbound, Hellbound, Hellbound Hellraiser two. Right, right, right. Usually I go for like Hellraiser, Hellbound, but it's yeah. just because my mind has been trained by the the, the modern movie. Well, and there's no there's no consistency the in first. Yeah, and there's no consistency yeah. in that because Hellraiser 2 is called Hellbound, Hellraiser 2, and the first one's called Hellraiser, and the third one is called Hellraiser 3, colon, Hell on Earth. That's so true. it's yeah. not like it's not called Hell Hell on Earth, colon, Hellraiser 3, which is what would have, <laughs> you know, been what they did on Hell on 2. I feel like I should start talking about the Rambo movies. Rambo, First Blood, Part 1. <laughs> yeah. Rambo, First Blood, Part 2. Rambo yeah. 3. Yeah. <laughs> well, the first one was just called First Blood, I think. Yeah, that's true. And then it was Rambo, First Blood, Part 2, and then, like, Rambo 3, and they took the first blood out of it. Yeah, the, uh, so... Fourth one, the fourth one was just called uh, Rambo. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, John yeah. Ram. Yeah. But but it's really cool. I mean, I really enjoyed your reviews, Rob. Yeah. Uh, your retro yeah. reviews. Uh, uh, I enjoyed yeah. doing them. Uh, I want to do some more. Uh, I'm going to do one more. I'm going to do one for the Dying Breed Director's Cut. I oh, started nice. it. I wrote my first paragraph the other night, so it's not exactly a retro review. It's still a you know I think it's still for sale, so you could probably just put it in the regular reviews. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You don't uh, have to. Make I it still a retro. would like to do one. I'd like to do one for uh, the original Candyman and uh, the Midnight Me Train. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. I'll have to hold off. You know back what? Up. Regardless of whether or not people uh, consider Candyman Three to be a a movie or not. I still enjoy the hack out of Hell Candyman 1 and 2. 2 yeah. was a really oh, yeah. good sequel. As yeah. far as sequels like the go, second the second one was pretty cool. Yeah. Even though it took the Candyman character in a different direction, but within the context of the first movie, it actually – I re- really enjoyed the origin they came up with for Candyman. I agree. I, too. Yeah, I, thought, I thought 2 was um, – Candyman 2 was pretty good. Yeah, it was but, pretty good. But three, on the other hand, is pretty terrible. It was That's directed the by the... the guys that did the Carrot Top movie. <laughs> is There's it a really? Carrot Top <laughs> movie? I mean, they did. That's, I mean, I'm not knock. I don't hate. Is that knock, what is that? Chair, but... Chairman of the board, right? Yeah, they directed that. They directed. <laughs> oh. oh. I'm not. I hate. Oh. That. Just, they're not. That's those funny. aren't the. You know. <laughs> couldn't you have gotten better directors? Yeah. To do it, even though I've. Even though I've stayed at the the Luxor a couple of times in Vegas, I never went to see the Carrot, Carrot Top show. I mean, Carrot Top is the uh, reside, resident uh, yeah. comedian there, but it's like I never never cared much about. I never cared much about prop comedy. Yeah, during your during your wedding, he was there. Um, he was, but I didn't. Not at my I didn't. <laughs> yeah, you know, he he wasn't. No, he wasn't at your. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought you meant he was at your wedding. No, he, he was at, oh, no, he was but, in the same the, hotel. Um, but but there's a funny thing. The guy who who officiated the ceremony, Adam Ducro, uh, he was also. I was watching before uh, before my wedding. I was watching TV in the bedroom at, in Vegas in the Mandalay Bay, uh-huh. and uh, I saw. No, it wasn't Mandalay Bay. It was the Luxor. And I saw on the TV pop up one of those infomercials that casinos play on the internal channel. And it's like, uh, you know, check out the Luxor and then you can, you know, get married in Mandalay Bay with, uh, you know. And then the, the thing was the official who celebrated my wedding to Sarah, he was doing a parody commercial where, where he pretended to marry Kara Top and a janitor. And oh, then at the yeah, end he said, right. ladies and gentlemen, Mr. and Mrs. Top. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I did and see I, that. I, I told him that. I told him that before the ceremony. I was like, "Oh, you saw that? I haven't seen that yet." And it's like that's real. That was really funny. We did it in an <laughs> afternoon. So, yeah, I don't know why I said this, but it's in the episode now. So let's just keep it. <laughs> All right, there yeah. you go. Um, so oh, the Scarlet Gospels Deluxe Edition from uh, from Earthling Press. Uh, it, they say it should be available this fall, and they've been adding extra things to the book, so it'll be worth the wait. Cool. Cool. So uh, and there's going to be a story that's not previously unpublished. Right, it's, right. Yeah. I think it's probably Lost Souls again. But, uh, cool, yeah. I mean, that's that, cool. I mean, I, I don't, I'd like to see edition. Lost Souls get a new, you know, you know, put out there. I don't, I mean, a lot of people uh, know, you know, uh, Lost Souls is what is it collected in? What, what book it, can you get that in? Uh, cutting Edge. Cutting Edge. So yeah. maybe this is a good way for the fans to get a a version of that story. Yeah. You know? They haven't officially said that that's the story, but I, it seems likely. Yeah. 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 Um, and, you know, it's a perfect companion because it ha- it's a Harry the Moore story. And, yeah. You know, it's got demons in hell and stuff like that. So I think it's a pr- it goes well with, uh, if, if it is Lost Souls, it will go well with the Scarlet Ghost. And hey, some people were were complaining about the Scarlet Gospel, saying that, oh, the Scarlet Gospels doesn't have any connection to previous uh, Harry the Moore adventures. Well, you you may be able to get another story, and it may be Lost Souls. So there you go. Yeah. Um. Oh, Clive Barker's next art exhibit uh, is uh, is a shared exhibit with Gail Pataki, and it's called Freaks Exploring the Unique. And that'll be at uh, Century Guild there in Culver City, California. 
September 26th at 7 p.m. is the opening night in reception. There you go. It's going to be cool. Yeah. If anybody in California tell, tell Thomas that we out. sent you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. You'll get the Clive Barker podcast discount. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> tell him that we demand that you get the Clive Barker podcast discount. <laughs> Gonna get us in trouble, but uh, uh, freaks exploring the unique. I think that some of the things they're going to be showing there, and don't quote me on it, but I th- think they're going to have some of the artwork that Clive came up with for that uh, uh, freak show uh, haunt thing that he did back in the I want to say nineties. Oh, okay. You know, I uh, I think I remember seeing something like the, the some pictures posted on Clive's Facebook about this, and I think I recognized a few from that freak show haunt that he did for Universal. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on it, but that's what I think. Century Guild okay. has been doing a great job of, of um, cataloging and archiving and and, uh, and making his art available for the public, which there, before there were just piles and piles of stuff that, you know, most people would never get to see. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Brick Green also did a lot of exhibits for Clyde Barker. Yeah, yeah. And uh, La Luz de Jesus Gallery as well, I think. Right. You know? right. Yeah. Uh, Mark Miller is going to be appearing as a special guest at StokerCon 2016 in Atlanta, Georgia, May 7th through 10th. So, Rob, that's not too far away from you. Yeah. Atlanta, <laughs> <laughs> Georgia. Woo! Yeah. Squidbillies. <laughs> Yeah, that's that. I'd probably have to drive a bus down there, a Greyhound. How long is it? How long is that? Uh... Uh, it's about a four-hour drive. Oh, okay. It's not too bad. I took, it's not. It's not bad. I took a bus to L.A. It was okay. Yeah. I took the bus to L.A. Ryan picked yep. me up. Yeah. It was yeah. fun. It was fun. On the way back, I was sitting next to this old gentleman who was carrying like a phone with him, but it was like an actual phone, not a not a cell phone, <laughs> and he was taking advantage of the free. Wall- wi-fi in the bus to talk to his son and he had a mini router connected to the phone it was pretty impressive what wireless router i know it's ridiculous right but you know so so he had the phone cord plugged into a router so that he could talk on a regular telephone instead of a cell phone yes like (laughs) it was was like a mi-fi thing yes i wow uh, i know it was like i sent a picture that would have been awesome if it was a rotary dial yeah, well, no. <laughs> but I, I actually, Andrew Furtado can confirm this because I wasn't the boss. Andrew Furtado texted me uh, after we talked, uh, you know. So, and and I, I texted him. I said, you can't, you won't believe what I'm just seeing here in the bus. There was a guy sitting next to me with a mini router and a phone in the bus taking advantage of the Wi-Fi. And he was like, wow, that's great. <laughs> so I took a picture of the phone and the wife oh, my lover that were next to me, and I sent it to him. So, yeah. Greyhound buses. They're awesome. <laughs> do, do you still have that picture? Probably, yeah. <laughs> That'd be yeah, cool if we, could, if we could add it to the show notes. Yeah, I'd like sure. to Maybe. It. Yeah, if you can find it, you know, with a relative ease. I'll look for it, but it's like it was taken, like, last year. So yeah, who knows yeah. Where it is. Yeah, actually, like, more than a year ago, right? Because that was in July of... 2014. That's right. It was so Has hot. Has it been a year? Day. Has it been a year since then and all that? Yes. God, it's just gone by. It's flown by. Yeah. 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 So mm. be sure to check out Mark Miller and StokerCon 2016 in Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. Tell him the podcast sent you. Yep. Yeah. You'll get a discount again. Yep. Yep. So just tell him the podcast sent you. Yeah. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. <laughs> Uh, the oh the Leviathan documentary giveaway. I don't know. Yeah, this was going on for a long time, so it's probably still going. Yeah, it's yeah. on like sometime in September. Yeah, so if you like their page, and we'll have a link on the show notes, but you like their page and you share it and you comment, then you get entered in. Uh, they have two copies of the Leviathan documentary to give away. Yeah, Dead Mouse UK. They were one of the producers of the documentary. Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, along with cult screenings, UK. Yeah, and so uh, here's your chance to win the Leviathan documentary. Is is it the Julius Lee version? Did do they have? I think or? yes, yes, and oh, awesome. I think it is because that because I, I think we saw the pictures of it. It's sold out, so 
Yeah. There, there's going to be more, I think, from what Gary Smart told us. They, they will have more copies uh, for sale in the future. But it's not going to have the Julius sleeve. But it's still yeah. going to be the same inside cover, the same three DVDs. So it's you're just oh. missing out the slip cover. You've yeah. got to destroy that mattress. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to destroy that mattress. Yeah. Uh, in more l- day, I still I, I look at the movie and I'm like, what police officer would have evidence from a crime scene be tagged and sent to like a doctor's house? <laughs> like you don't. Yeah, no. <laughs> no one. <laughs> That's how it works. Yeah, yeah. It, you know. It, <laughs> It, it, you know, I'm not talking trash about how we're going to, but it's like only that it's something. Like, you show a scene of, off, like, Dr. Chenard, like, like yeah. driving the cop or something. Yeah, well, and he's on the phone saying, no, not to the main entrance to my house. It's out of the house. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, and the, and the police was like, well, I'm not really supposed to do this. I was supposed to put this in our evidence room, but okay. What were you going to say, Rob? Oh, nothing. I was just saying, uh, uh, repeating. He doesn't even repeat it twice. He's like, you know, put it to the side of the house. And, yeah. And yeah. Says, Let me repeat that. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. For um, for, for Kyle's um, for Kyle's benefit. Yeah. And let's not get started on Doctor Chenard's curtains. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, more Leviathan news. Uh, in Sydney, Australia, our friend who's been on the podcast before, um, Steve Dillon, is doing a screening of Leviathan. He's going to have copies of those. He's going to maybe have some copies of those uh, Leviathan uh, DVDs is to to sell there as well. They they might awesome. be the the Julius Leave ones if he bought them early enough. Yeah. Yeah. So my advice to you before you go to the screen, don't drink any fluids for like an hour before you watch the movie because it's long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or you just tell Steve, pause it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so where? Now, is he and a beautiful the... darkness. Well, isn't oh, yeah, he, he's scre- is he screening the two hour version? Yeah. He's just doing the two hour version. Oh, yeah. okay. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Uh, so in the beautiful what? darkness, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. That's fine. All right, then I guess we can cut that part in. Yeah. And, and the beautiful darkness, Leviathan soundtrack news, is that the Indiegogo that uh, uh, Lito Velasco was uh, putting up has been funded. Uh, it's been funded yeah. at $1,712 over the goal by a little bit, like 114%. So I would say over the goal, yeah, bum that you missed the deadline, don't be... We will continue to offer CD perks until we sell out the remaining 34 units. So I don't know if those are even for sale anymore. But, uh, you know, you can go back and see the post that Rob did. And uh, there will also be digital downloads as well as iTunes, Spotify, and Amazon. So we will definitely review this uh, for the for the podcast. Yeah, I, I didn't uh, I didn't chip in for that, but I'll probably get it on iTunes. I did, and, uh, yeah, I'm probably, I'll do a review for it if you'd like me to do that. Yeah, yeah, that'd be cool. Well, and we can all, it could also be Tuesday, no. Tuesday Tunes if there's one that's available to share. Or if he yeah, has, if cool. maybe he could get us a clip or something. Mm-hmm. What's cool about the soundtrack is, uh, you know how in the the documentary it was uh, looped? A lot of the music was looped. We'll get to hear the yeah. all it, se- all 76 minutes of the score that he created. So yeah, yeah. Those are going to be new. A lot of new stuff we've not heard. Really? That's right, because what? sometimes you would hear a little bit of one track, but you didn't hear the whole. But you think yeah, over the whole like course the, of that, like eleven hours of that movie, that we didn't hear the whole soundtrack. <laughs> well, I'm well, sure we, we heard, did mention that. You know, as, I'm sure we heard, you know, probably the all, not like Jose was saying, like the whole the track. Gist of it. Yeah. The jets, yeah. Huh. Well, so, I mean, yeah, I, I, I imagine, imagine that, that, like, you wouldn't hear a whole song all together, but, you I mean, I would have thought that maybe we would have at least, you could put it all together to make, I don't know. I'm not sure. Well, in any in any case, anyone who gets a CD or buys the, the copy of the digital download, you get to listen to the whole soundtrack, yeah. which, again, you know, from what I've heard, and 
what I've experienced in the documentary and what I've heard from uh, like the the main theme track that was sent to us by uh, Lito Velasco uh, that we put yeah. in that video on the YouTube yeah, uh, channel. That was that was pretty nice. It's like for me, it it's was. like a little alternative dimension Christopher Young uh, soundtrack for Hellraiser one and yeah. two. It's like. What if, you know, he had gotten out of the bed on the other side that day, <laughs> you know, and he composed something a little more different. And, uh, you know, that's that's a good thing. I always like to listen to reimaginings and and things done in the style of something. Uh, I like to hear new takes on existing styles. So, so this, yeah. this was really cool. The the uh, Headhunter store has limited edition Hellraiser busts. So we see posts from him once in a while on Occupy Midian and other Clive Barker related sites, you know, just stuff that he's at, you know, that toys that he sort of hand makes and statues and stuff like that. So he's doing Hellraiser busts. Now, wasn't the good, good looking, yeah. Wasn't the Headhunter store partnered with um with the Labyrinth for a while? Yeah, with Nexus Concept Studios, I Oh, think. that's what it is. Okay. So yeah, So the Labyrinth isn't um Mark Buckle's not doing that anymore? I think he is. I think he is. I think he was trying to pass it on to someone else, but uh, he's still doing it. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. I don't know if I should have said that, but in any case, Mark Buckle is running the Labyrinth, and he also has Nexus Concept Studios. Oh, okay. And I think they were partnered with uh, the Headhunter store. Like gotcha. Said. Okay. So the Headhunter guy, he's not in America. He's, like, from uh, from. Europe, I think. Yeah, yeah. Finland or something. I want to say Finland, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, and of course, Mark Buckle is in Australia. But yeah. But yeah, those you can see the, um, the the pictures of the bus. I mean, he's been posting stuff like this all the time, and uh, they look really nice. They're very detailed. Yeah. Um, the the limited edition set is only available at ten pieces per character world, worldwide, so uh, that's really limited. If only ten other people are going to have your pinhead bust, or only nine other people, really. But uh, yeah, so it's cool. I mean, if you're into the whole thing of busts and stuff, I mean, I these are hand painted, so so they already come painted. Apparently, I never bought uh, busts or kits because I can't paint to save my life. So uh, just having something unassembled and unpainted to me would be really boring. So I never really got into the whole kits and busts. But, you know, it's cool. They're really well, well done. Um, and uh, the the next one, what was it? Um, oh, uh, Johnny Raymond had shared on his Facebook page this new Clive Barker painting, uh, which was just incredible. Uh, it's yeah. kind of this sort of fetal-looking monster. I'm it's all kind of raw. And, drawing and, into something more. Yeah, it's kind of raw and bloody, and and uh, it's it and it really kind of fits with the last time we talked with Thomas Nigovin, and he was talking about um, Clive Barker's new style, and how it's mm-hmm. more it's more uh, raw and sort of more um, more subconscious, I guess. Yeah, yeah, like it it it, it provides you with a certain degree of impressionism and. Uh... Yeah, it's very visceral, definitely. I mean, you know what this this painting reminds me of? It reminds me of uh, you remember in Weave World, like the the monster babies from uh, the ghost sister of Immaculata, the Byblos. Yes, yeah, yes. yeah, the Byblos, right? Yeah, yeah. That that's kind of what it makes me think of the Byblos. Yeah, uh, they have the guts on the outside and the big, you know, weird head. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that that was posted by Johnny Raymond. Yeah, Johnny it, Raymond also posted a picture of Clive Barker wearing clown mask. Clown mask, that was yeah. really cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I like yeah. that. And you can get more uh, more Clive Barker sketches still on eBay. I think that's ongoing. Century Guild, you know, keeps selling those. Um, Barbie Wilde's new short story collection, uh, and we should talk to her about this because it's coming up soon. It's mm-hmm. going to be out in October of 2015. It's called Voices of the Damned, and it has a Clive Barker painting on the cover. And there's more Clive Barker artwork inside. Oh, really? Awesome. I thought, well, I didn't know it was inside. There was more inside. Well, there's another art. Well, I mean, I don't know if it was inside, but there was another piece of artwork that she showed that was also for this book. So I don't know where it goes, but. Could be the back cover. Maybe. Or something. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. But it's yeah. nice. I mean, uh, it's always fun to read more from our favorite, you know, Cenobites. 
And yeah. I know that uh, Barbie Wilde, she kind of opened up her – and I, I'm going to say this. I don't know if it was the first book that she ever wrote. It was the first book that I've read from her. But she did The Bar- uh, the Venus Complex, and it was a full-fledged novel. And now she's going to the sh- short story uh, – You know, she's going to take the, the, the short story away, which you know, it's also very interesting because short stories are uh, a style that requires uh, – they can be very rewarding. Yeah. And, and it can be easier to read than a novel. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this. I am too. And, and I'm looking forward to talking with her again. Hope, um, we, we've had her on two or three times now. Uh, she's always been really great to talk to. And it'll be nice to kind of review this and talk with her about it. Absolutely. So stay tuned for that. Uh, yeah. Is it on pre order already? Um, I don't know. I didn't find in my news post, I didn't put a link to any kind of pre-order so I, I think that okay. she had said something about being able to pre-order it somewhere but i i don't remember exactly like through the publisher yeah. maybe because i'll definitely pre-order this voices of the yeah. damned by barbie wild yeah it's gonna have a foreword by chris alexander editor-in-chief of fangoria and an afterword by the suska sisters which seem to be a pretty hot item right now and the you know yeah uh, in, well yeah independent, rock, uh, independent horror films yeah, Barbie and, and uh, Nick are like um, interacting the with them. Sisters, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, they did American Mary and I think Ginger Snaps. And, uh, oh, okay. I've seen Ginger Snaps, but I've never seen American Mary. They did a. Uh, what was the sequel to See No Evil Two with Kane, the wrestler? Oh, That's right. yeah, right. Yeah. I've not seen that one yet. I'd like to see it. I heard it was pretty good. It was fun. I heard it was real fun. I think Nico did like a hangout where he was discussing uh, one of those sequels for *See No Evil*, uh, like yeah. a long time ago. Yeah. He did. Also, this book is going to have artwork and illustrations by Clive Barker, Nick Percival. <laughs> this name seems familiar. I know. Has he done work for other Bar- Barker books? Nick Percival. I think I I've heard some. Is he? Um, he's a, he, he was a cover artist, right? Right, right. And Steve McGinnis, Danielle Sarah, who was. The artist who did the artwork for uh, the Venus Complex cover. And uh, Eric Gross is going to provide some uh, followers of the Pandorics. He's going to provide some artwork for it. Uh, Tara Bush, Vincent Sammy, and Ben Baldwin. So there you go. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I, I love the look of this book. And I really like uh, I like her writing style. So I'm really looking forward to this one. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, with Clive Barker artwork on the cover, yeah, we're in. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So off the record, maybe we can get her to give us um, to send us ebook copies so that we can read it in advance. You know, before they come in the oh, mail. Oh, that would be a good idea. Yeah, so then we can read it before we have her on. Yeah, we should send her like a, a group message and uh, ask her about it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So okay, okay so you- back on the record. Um, oh, yeah. So our very last thing uh, for as far as like news, um, we just recently had our 100th episode. And if you're listening to this, you probably know that um, because you probably already heard the 100th episode. But um, we, we, you know, it was a big kind of a celebration. So, you know, go to our blog and, and check out. We, you know, we wrote the, we, we pasted the whole thing out as a, you know, as an interview format. Uh, and also the intro video um, that Jose you put together with um, all of us asking our questions to Clive Barker, the one that we actually sent to them, uh, yeah, sent to yeah. Clive to to uh, you know to get the answers from him. So um, mm-hmm. all of that's in there in that blog post. Um, episode one hundred, Clive Barker a- answers our questions. That's right. It yeah. was it was a really it fun a episode. Answers. It was a milestone. Yeah. Oh yeah. And uh, and I kind of reached out to the community here and said, "Hey, is there anything you want us to talk about?" Matt Stone says, "Book three of the art." Um, so really, there's not a whole lot to say about that. Um, he had said he had some new ideas for how that book was going to go. Um, he so said he, once that he knew how it. it was going to finish it. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, so. Um, but that doesn't mean it's going to come out in the, even in the next three years. So I would say, you know, it's going to probably be at least five years before book three of the art. I mean, I'm not trying to, to rain on anybody's parade, but it's just, you know, it's going to be like two plus years before the uh, the next Aberat book comes out. 
Yeah, I guess we can just speculate on what we think the book will be. I mean, yeah, we saw uh, folders that said uh, "Book of the Yard Three when we were yeah uh, Seraphim, but we didn't really open them, or at least I didn't. I don't know if anybody yeah. else. But uh, no, no, I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, felt like a trespasser. The first, the first volume, uh, the Great Secret Show. Um, it's great. It introduces us to the Adorobros and all that. Mm. And then the second book, Everville. We we should probably reread that book, re, you know, yeah. because we're going to be addressing it at some point in the near future. Yeah. So that's going to be interesting for me because honestly, I don't. I think it's a book that I read only once, so I don't really remember yeah. much of it. It seems like it for, goes deeper into the theology behind uh, behind the books of the art. Yeah, and then it, yeah. it you know. You know, there's like this guy who gets caught by a, a angry husband. He was with his wife, and I'm not going to spoil anything. But it's like, and, and it was really interesting to see how Clyde Barker sees like the afterlife and uh, what happens to people when they die. And you know, uh, there's a lot of it that takes place in liquidity. Yeah, well, and there's uh, a lot. Of, always cool. It, it's a lot of um, the theology has a lot to do with dreams and storytelling. I'm not sure if the third book will have it. Will, do you think? Do you guys think the Yadda Robberus are going to come back for the third volume, or do you think he's going to be getting a new villain or a new monster for the uh, the antagonist of the third I don't volume? No, I mean, they're, well, he's he, still got he still got a. Well, I don't want to spoil it. Uh, spoil it, but well, this is a spoiler for anybody listening to this, what I'm about to say. But okay. what about what, what about uh, uh, Tommy? Oh, Tommy! Oh, right? the, the Death Boy. Death Boy. I mean, he still he didn't die at the you know at yeah. the end of the Right. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. So, the, I mean, he, he still he, got, yeah. He only died at the end of the Great and Secret Show, not at the end of Everville. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So who knows? He might yeah. come back. He might bring some characters back. Yeah. It, I mean, there's really not there's really not uh, much that we can go by in terms of Book of the Yard three. Right. Yeah. I mean, they're Clive both usually they're talks both so self contained. Yeah. It, it's not like Aberat. Um, where, you know, there's a clear path, you know, there's a clear expl- expectation of what's going to happen next. Or it's it's sort of set like a big a big overarching story, you know, that's leading up to a big climax. The books of the art are more self-contained. I, I've got a feeling, though, that from what he said over the years, that he, he he's going to tackle uh, some deep-set things in the American culture. Because this book is going to take place in America, and mm. I have an idea that this might take place in present time, but that's just speculation yeah. for me. Well, every yeah. one of them so far has taken place in present time, you know. Yeah. They, or they they have a they have a one section in the back, you know, the, the, in the in the past, and then then they then they move over to present time, which is like 1988 in the Great and Secret Show, and then. 1993 or whatever in Everville. Right. But it's going to be a big difference between the America of 93 and the America of 2015. So I yeah. don't know exactly how that's going to factor in in terms of like uh, any other issues yeah. that are big in the American culture right now. And so, uh, uh, and without spoiling the Scarlet Gospels, there's a really big change with Harry Damore. And is that going to carry through into the book, book three of the art? That's right. I, I always figured that this would... T- take place in a different, you know, time period or something. I I always see that I'm going to see the Scarlet Gospels as kind of like one of Harry Damore's last adventure yeah. or something. Uh although it doesn't have to be his last adventure by any means, but uh Yeah, but so, he's not the he's not so, the same as he was. I don't know. Right, right. Yeah. So there you go, Book of the Art 3. We know as much as you do. Yeah. So <laughs> To be and honest, that's that's pretty much our answer. Not very much. And Scott Cohen said, Aberat 4, Art 3, any movie TV projects that may be on the, the horizon? Thanks. That would be great. Keep up the great work, guys. Um, so we just talked about Book of the Art 3. Aberat 4, um, I'm just going to... You have either... I don't think... Rob, have you read the Aberat books? I haven't. I'm waiting okay. for the. I'm waiting for the fourth book. I, I'm going to start reading. When yeah. the fourth book comes And Jose, out. I know you read the first two, right? So yes. So Aberat three has a really kind of a huge. You know, I, the books are basically getting darker e- on each one. And and when Aberat three came out, Clive had said that it was because it's the middle book of a five book set. 
it has the you know the sort of climax and then and then you know we're kind of and then the heroes are sort of rising up in four and five so i think mm-hmm. i think the darkest one maybe is already passed maybe the um absolute midnight is well i mean it's called absolute midnight so but i think that might be the darkest one and i think that it's going to be you know it's going to be a little more um uplifting after that so okay. the fourth book the fourth upcoming book is going to be called Cree rising yeah is that still the the, the title that that's the la- yeah i think that's still the last thing so i don't know who Cree is did he appear or is he mentioned in the no book? no i think okay. it's a i think that's something new we're gonna to have to learn so about something's gonna come up from you know the the the, the act yeah. ashes of apparat or something and some sort of character is going to come up and yeah. rise to power i'm guessing movies and yeah. tv projects on the horizon um what was the name of that book uh of that movie that's supposed to be um looking for pre-production what about that couple that's going to be involved in some sort of voodoo stuff yeah, that was the entwine the, yeah the entwine. the entwine well there's the entwine yeah yeah what happened uh, to that they were supposed to if they set up opposite offices in georgia and it just you never heard anything else about it it sounded like they were getting ready i'm guessing they're in pre-production they're probably trying to gather up uh investors and come up with a script and stuff like that so these things sometimes they take years from when they're announced which is always a good a good you know keep always in mind that whenever a movie project is announced who knows when it's going to come out? Well, and for every yeah. one of these that we've heard about, like this and and um, Jacqueline, Jacqueline S, there's S. there's like four or five of them that they're trying to do that we don't know about that we may you know that that may never surface. Sure. So the, for now, there's like Jacqueline S, and they're yeah. the entwined, and um, so so there you go. It's like there's those two movies to look forward to that we know about. Yeah. And, there was, you know, a TV, the, there was a TV show. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, huh. For for Clyde Barker stuff. Yeah, it was. He was producing it. It was. What was the name of it? Oh, oh it was the copy pasta thing. Oh yeah, yeah, right, right. The, the, the creepy um, pasta or whatever. Yeah, Clyde no, Barker's creepy pasta. It, it wasn't that. It was something else. It was. A, I'll have to. Find it and post it on a, okay. or a Facebook page and let people know. Yeah, because it, sure. it sounded really cool. What? what it, okay. Well, I'm looking at Clyde Barker's uh, Wikipedia uh, IMDb page. I'm sorry, and I, all I see is the Entwined, um, and there's Hellraiser announced. It doesn't even have a date. Of course. Yeah, of course, it's, it's supposed to make. It's and yeah. Then, it's just still an idea. Yeah, as producer maybe as a producer on IMDb. There's the Entwined as executive producer. Oh, yeah, there's Clive Barker Presents Jojo Baby, the documentary. Oh, yeah. He was yeah. Uh, executive producer. Yeah, and that's, and, that's like, almost done, isn't it? I mean, I think they made sure. it, and it's just they're just putting out the – putting together the – Yeah, it's about a drag queen performer named Jojo Baby. Yeah. And then there's, you know, that's pretty much it. So I don't, I don't see any other thing. But I, I think I do remember something being mentioned Uh yeah. Um, maybe it's just one of those ideas that's bouncing around in surfing offices, and you know. Yeah. It's yeah. It's still it's, early. It's not even more than just an idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, Scott McKeegan. That's what it's called. What's Incarnate. that? Incarnate. Remember that was it was called Incarnate. Incarnate. Mm-hmm. Incarnate. Clive Barker. Yeah. Now that you mentioned the name, I do remember something, and the only thing I can come up with for Incarnate. Is that was uh, Palatin Media and Copper Heart in joint venture to present Incarnate. Clive is set to executive produce this 12 times one hour series for TV alongside Steve Hoban and Carl- Clark Peterson. Clive will also act as creative consultant to the project, which is written by Judith and Garfield Reeves Stevens. So, this is stuff that was posted in April 2015. So, yeah. okay. not too long ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, there we go. Tagline from Clive is: "This is the next evolution in genetics. It is the mutation of the spirit." And the synopsis for this, now that, well, I might as well read it: "A series of mysterious and unexplained phenomena are starting to take place. On this day, science journalist Susan Foster decides to end her life rather than face the reality of the news she has just received: that she has been diagnosed with terminal cancer. But before she can take action, she's asked by Francis Panati, 
a Jesuit scholar, to investigate a shocking claim. 18 years ago, an unknown number of embryos were genetically manipulated using different sources of DNA, including some taken from a priest possessed by a demonic entity. Joined by Jim Hyams, a disgraced rookie cop betrayed by his fellow officers, their search for the truth draws them into an ongoing police investigation of the rise of a charismatic teenage gang leader and a sociopathic teenage killer, both with seemingly supernatural powers. Facing unknown enemies within religious organizations, the military, and the highest reaches of government, Susan Panetti and Hyams discover that dark secrets from their own unexpectedly linked pasts are inextricably bound with a staggering conspiracy that could redefine the age-old war between science and faith and change the world forever. <laughs> so, so there you go. That sounds cool. Uh, It'd be kind of nice to see a, a Clive Barker twist on, like, the X-Files. Yeah. Headline, this is how the world ends. So, um, yeah. there we go. I like the way you ended that. How's that, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> Yep. It says, uh, Clyde Barker describes it as X-Men meets The Exorcist in a modern-day day drama series about a force of evil living in our midst and three unlikely heroes who must work together as a team to stop it. Yay! Cool. That sounds really cool. Incarnate. So let's see if this takes takes over. Yeah. yeah. Uh, on Twitter, uh, at Scott McKeating says, love to hear your thoughts on why such a recent explosion of work slash projects coming out. And uh, and what you think is likely to come next in terms of a novel? So I guess the first part is um, I think it's great. I think that really it's just better organization at Seraphim is really what's causing all of these new explosion of projects. Sure, you know, well, and, and like limited. all the little the, the limited editions of of you know things like there's Maximilian Bacchus and and you know the Body Book and the and uh, First Tales and. And all the audio books, and it's just really—I mean, it's just really a, a lot of hardworking people at Seraphim taking drawers and drawers of stuff and saying, you know, we should put this out so everybody can read it. Absolutely, yeah. That's how you get the, the Midnight Meat Train. Yeah. Out, uh, the Fiddle Black edition of uh, Cabal. Yeah. With like uh, all these essays and critical uh, critical essays. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Yeah, that's that's cool stuff. Sometimes I wish that this stuff would come out. In a in a more uh, you know instead of being limited, be a more wide uh, uh, availability. Mm-hmm. But you know th- sometimes it's just because that's they're limited by one uh, money, two yeah. uh, small publishing companies, and uh, you know. But hey, the Scarlet Gospels was like a big hit. It was like number nine in the uh, New York Times bestseller list. So yeah, I'm sure they sold a lot of copies of that one. Well, and and uh, Thomas St. had Martin's made a good point too. Thomas. Is that you know he could make more than a thousand copies of, of Imaginer, but but maybe you know that he wouldn't get that many people buying it. Well, yeah. At some point, the more copies you make of a book, the cheaper it is to manufacture it. But but then also when you mass produce something, it's not the same standard of quality. Yeah, uh, it, it just falls apart a little bit if you start making like a mass production. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so then his second party had said, what do you think is most likely to come out next in terms of a novel? So uh, if we're talking about, if we're talking about a, like a mass market novel, I think it's going to be Aberat 4 for sure. Um, oh, yeah. But but if we're talking about like special edition kinds of things, uh, we know about the body book. That's not a novel, I guess. But if there's any, if there's any other secret hidden novels in the works, we don't know about them. I mean, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see more stuff coming. You know, sure, especially stuff that Clyde Barker wrote when he was younger. Yeah, and, you know, well, and even to like kind of um, that, edit it. Even like Mister Begone sort of came as a, a surprise. It was like, you know, he was in the middle of working on Aberat, uh two, I think. And then it's all of a sudden, hey, here's you know, here's something that you know I just had to write, and you know nobody it took even him like eight months to do it. I yeah, think. and he had, I, as far as I know, he'd never mentioned that in you know publicly at all. It was just surprise. Here's a book. Sure. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, that was. Um, but yeah, it was I mean, a voice that showed up in his mind, and he had to make the book to make the voice of Jackabot go. Away. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He really said that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and at Cindy, Cindy M67 says, uh, let's talk about how handsome Clive is. Uh, pretty handsome. Yeah. Pretty handsome. Especially yeah. when he's wearing a clown mask. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's, for his age, he's built pretty good. Yeah. Too. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, re- I remember my mom talking about how handsome he was when I first started, uh, you know, getting into Clive Barker stuff in the 90s. Oh, yeah. sure. Especially those pictures that came in the back of, uh, you know, uh, Cabal and Great and Secret yeah, Show. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like you know, Clive is a pretty handsome looking guy. Some people say he kind of reminds them of Paul McCartney. Yeah. And actually, a little bit of trivia. One of those pictures of him that was in the back of his books was actually taken by Linda McCartney. Oh, wow. Uh, really? Yeah, I think so, yeah. I think I remember seeing something like that on the credits. I do. Re- I remember that, too, but I can't remember which bo- which book that was. Mm-hmm. Well, it's probably... Like Great and Secret Cabal. Show or Magica or something? Hey, Clive is doing well. I mean, he's yeah. getting stronger by the day, and he's always been a pretty good-looking guy. So, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, Clive is a pretty good-looking guy. <laughs> and, uh, I think he, uh, he looks, always looks good with a beard or a goatee or something like that. That's right. When he didn't have yeah. anything, he looked kind of baby-faced. Yeah. 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 Chris Haggerty says, uh, regarding episode 100, another wonderful show. Thank you, Ryan, Jose, and Rob. I've been meaning to leave a message for a while now as the podcast has been a great enjoy- enjoyment and appreciate your hard work and passion putting it together. Best wishes, Chris. So oh, thanks. thanks Chris. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Chris Haggerty. That was awesome. We appreciate that. Yeah, we do this for you guys. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's also kind of cathartic to talk on the phone with fellow fans of Clyde Barker because for, for a long time, um, you know, I didn't have anybody to talk to about how cool Clyde Barker artwork and books are. So. Yeah. I would just have to go on the internet to talk to other people in forums like the Fifth Dominion. Yeah. Well, and, um, in the '90s, at least, you know, people around you would say, "Oh, yeah, that guy." But now it's kind of like people around me don't even know who he is anymore. Yeah, they need to get back on the saddle because one uh, one uh, old Clay Barker fan showed up on the Fifth Dominion uh, Facebook page, and he was like, "Hey guys, I, it's been eight years since I've read anything by Clay Barker." And it's like, what did I miss? And we were like, oh, boy, I've got a, <laughs> yeah. got a list for you. Up a bunch yeah. of stuff. Uh, like Aberat, you know, uh, well, in the last eight years, Aberat 1 and 2 already came out, right? I mean, Aberat 2 came out in 2008, I think. Holy cow, 2004? yeah. 2004? 2004. Yeah, I so, guess but, in Clyde Parker time, eight years they, isn't a huge amount of time. Yeah, but definitely he had, like, Chiliad, First Tales, Scarlet yeah. Gospels, you know, Midnight Metrian book. Yeah. You know, all these things that come out. And, uh, yeah, he, it's been it's been a pretty couple of prolific years. Yeah. Well, and I think First Tales and Maximilian Bacchus, you know, a person shouldn't miss out on those. I, and that's, yeah. that's kill, I'm kicking myself in the head about that for not, you know, because like I said, I just got back into Clyde Barker through y'all oh, last, yeah, yeah. last year. And like uh, that was uh, that Maximilian Bacchus was, you know, already sold out. And you uh, well, try, um, try to found a copy of that and it's like. Two or three hundred dollars. Oh, I man. really want to get that. Wow. Well, let's let's see if we can get um, Roy Robbins. Oh, right? Yeah, Roy from Bad Moon Books. Yeah, yeah that's the the, the the guy who uh, has Bad Moon Books. The company yeah. that pushed it. Yeah. Are we sure, we can ask him. Yeah. 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 Definitely. And I'm willing to pay. Okay. Um. And, uh, Paul Fluitt, uh, who, who you know, published author who wrote the the book uh, Poor Jeffrey. He uh, said, what a great 100 podcast present to receive. I've been saying for a long time that it'd be nice for Clive to answer some questions for you. Now it's happened. Is this the Barker seal of approval? I hope so. Here's to 100 <laughs> more. So, yeah. Thanks, Paul. It's, it's been really cool. Yeah. And, uh, it's always nice to be able to communicate with Clive in any way. So. Yeah, um, yeah. And as far as it being a seal of approval, I kind of think so. Um you know, I think that he's aware of what we do, but I don't think that he sits down and listens to us talk. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's had enough of that. He wrote the books. He doesn't have to hear fans yeah. talk about them. Yeah. So, uh, he probably gets feedback from people like Thomas and, yeah. you know. Mark. 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 Definitely Mark. Oh, Paul Fluid also added, I had the pleasure of appearing on one of the podcasts. I can't think of what number. Uh I can tell you that right now. You showed up on episode forty-six. Favorite Clive Barker memories. So that was how, uh, Ryan you, Jose guest Paul Fluitt. How did you come up with that so fast? Oh, I I looked up our website. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't have that good a memory. Yeah. You know, yeah. Forty-six. And he says, enjoyed every minute of it, despite having to wake up at some ungodly hour. Uh, Jose and Ryan are just true gents and deserve even more recognition from the Barker 
your community. Well, we humbly thank you and yeah. say that it's people like you who participate in our podcast that really make us make this worthwhile. Thank yeah. you. It, it, and it was fun. It was fun. Too. I was going to ask y'all. Besides, uh, y'all got a hundred episodes under your belt. Besides the Clyde Barker episode, which one was probably y'all's favorite to do? I mean, just in terms of you know topic and. Well, I would say a lot. Some of the episodes we did with Nicholas Vince are always a pleasure to have him on the podcast. And he's really <clears throat> fun to interview because he puts you at ease, and he yeah. has a very slow way of talking. Yeah, and he kind of like lulls you into the interview, and also, of course, Simon Banford and, and Barbie, he's, but. And, and Nicholas and, Vince also, uh, once you're done seeing something, all of a sudden you hear his booming laughter. Yeah. And it kind of uplifts you. Yeah. And it's really fun. And and Ann Bobby, too, uh, was really kind of put us at ease, I think, during the oh, during God, our yeah. talk about so Nightbreed. Yeah. I, I, really really um, I, I also really enjoyed I also really enjoyed every time we had a major announcement for Occupy Midian. Uh-huh. Um, just, just you know, being swept up in the excitement about that and having this outlet to t- talk about it, I think was really yeah. cool. When we talked about the fact that it was coming out from Shout Fact. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. We, we were probably sounding like a bunch of geeks at the beginning of the episode. We well, and going, even oh. little, even little announcements like the time that we heard that Morgan Creek was going to allow the Cabal Cut to get screened at more places besides just the Mad Monster Party. Oh yeah, we even started a special feature within the podcast called Occupy Midian. Uh, no, the, the Occupy Midian Report. Yes. That was done by a friend, Crystal Vaughn. Yeah. 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 I remember that. Yeah, sure. yeah, and she had because um, she had, she had to set up a site that was collecting all the all the Nightbreed she news. Po- she posted my video on that uh, article. Remember, I right. made a video. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, she I remember that. that on the- yeah, cool. yeah, and I mean, also I also enjoyed all the episodes we did about projects that never got made. And, <laughs> yeah, uh, and and I liked and I really liked short stories. You know, rare short stories episodes too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because the the thing about the things that never got made is that it made me uh, go on and do some re- research on some of these things that I read about in Revelations, Clyde Barker dot info, and uh, especially for the Mummy, Clyde Barker's The Mummy that was never made, that was going to be actually the Mummy movie was made by mm-hmm. Universal. Yeah. and that's when I started researching and I found out, you know, all the information about, uh, you know, what it was going to be like the story and it was going to be like this, this uh, Egyptian exhibition and it would be like this yeah. and it was really really fun I mean it was really fun to research that and actually find out more than I already knew uh, looking up this stuff for the podcast which is also yeah. a growing experience for me because it's different if you're reading a book just for your own pleasure or if you're reading a book to review it or analyze it in a podcast yeah. you pay more attention sometimes to the book and you you draw parallels and you try to figure out oh with this this he did this because you know he was setting this up for that and you start analyzing and breaking it down a little bit and it kind yeah. of gives you more insight into the mechanic of the story I think at least for me even just a simple thing like uh, writing down people's names which is what I do a lot of times my only notes. Uh, for for one of the novels when we're going to talk about them is just a, a list of people's names because for me that's usually enough to jar my memory to remember everything that happened in the book. Uh, but that's what, what I started to do. I started to write notes uh, with a Magica. Mm, uh, yeah, yeah. That book that helped me remember a lot of stuff and take in. There are a lot of character names in there. Yeah, and yeah. and half of the book is is what seems like non. Not in not connected characters, and then and then the second half of the book you start figuring out how they're all connected Connect. to each other. Yeah, but it's like you don't. At first, it's it's a either, on the first read through, it's a little frustrating because it's like, yeah. how what do all these people have to do with each other? When when is the story going to start? Um, at least oh, that, okay. that that was for me. You know, on the first read through, like back in high school. Um, but the, the the name thing, I just want to say this. Like Rob, you mentioned Tommy. Uh, from from uh, Everville in the Great and Secret Show, and if you had just said like the Jaffe son, I probably would have struggled to come up with the name. But as soon as you said Tommy, I was like the Death Boy, and yeah. I immediately remember the whole character story arc. So yeah, yeah, that's that's true. 
So when you were in uh, high school, you were going to say something. You read a. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. Uh, so Imagica, just reading the Imagica in high school, the um, it was frustrating trying to get through Imagica, and and it's like, well, how do the, what do these characters have to do with each other? You know, and and the first half of the book, you couldn't. It was hard to figure out. You know, why am I reading about Dowd, and why am I reading about Oscar Godolphin, and you know, and but then um, you know, more subsequent read throughs. It's a it's a lot it's a lot easier, I think. Mm-hmm. I think that's the one book by Claude Barker I'm going to keep going back to. Yeah, the most. I do that all the time. I, I've, I've pick reread up. the Magica a lot. And sometimes I just pick it up and start reading parts of it just out of the blue just to, to enjoy it because I love, love it so much. So, yeah. All right. Well, thanks, guys. Another thanks for listening. Yeah. And another good enjoy. episode here. So yeah. enjoy and uh, yeah. catch you on episode Take 102. Care. All right. Have a good night. All right. Good night. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. 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 The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial fan site and podcast that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Films. This podcast and site are a labor of love by the fans for the fans. News, features, and show notes for this episode can be found at www.clivebarkercast.com. Uh, Go to iTunes and please leave us a review. Reviews really help us get the word out about Clive Barker. You can also find us on Podomatic, Xbox Music Store, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, Double Twist, Blackberry, and Pocket Cast. Uh, We have a Facebook page, so come on and and, uh, like our Facebook page and and, uh, join the Occupy Media Group for lots of discussion about Nightbreed and other Clive Barker stuff. On Twitter, we're at BarkerCast and at OccupyMidian. Opening theme by Mark Buckle.